Chapter 9 The Queen Sends a Cross Now began busy days in the leper colony. Huts, real huts of wood, hammered together with nails, were to be built, replacing the hovels of branches and leaves, which the wind had carried away. Everyone, man, woman, and child, who had a working hand or arm, was given work to do. Some of the tools were makeshift, but there were a few good usable saws and planes and hammers. The men who had been carpenters, or who knew a little about woodworking, became very important people, a sort of aristocracy by popular acclaim. The sense of hopelessness among the sick people decreased, and now and again, above the noise of sawing and hammering, a strange new sound was heard. Laughter. As each dirty cabin went up and received its coat of whitewash, a fresh wave of industry and ambition stirred even the most apathetic. Father Damien was everywhere at once, directing, encouraging, doing the heavy labor. He stopped one morning to speak to a small boy standing on the little street between two rows of neatly placed homes. It's my home, father, the boy, beaming with pride, pointed to one of the newly finished cottages. Father Damien smiled. Are you going to plant flowers in front of it? He asked. Could I? I think flowers in front would look very nice, the priest assured him. And perhaps you could grow vegetables at the back, if you wanted to. The lad shouted in excitement, swung around, and hobbled as fast as he could into the house. Breathlessly, he passed the idea on to his mother. Soon there were two sets of rivalries in the colony. Groups of the builders would each start a house at the same time, and race to see which would finish first. At the same time, the men, too badly crippled to work at carpentry, labored with the women and children to lay out and plant attractive and useful gardens. The air was electric, charged with an entirely new element. Before Father Damien's arrival, the destructive disease had filled the minds and lives of everyone in the colony. The only thing they could plan on was death. But now there was constructive work to occupy them, and plans concerning the birth of flowers and vegetables in the gardens. No one can plant a plot of ground and be without hope, Father Damien happily assured himself. The grief which mainly distressed him in the midst of this progress was a personal one. It was now four months since he had been able to go to confession. It was with joy, then, that one day, when a small ship stood offshore to land some lepers, he saw that his former superior, Father Modeste, was aboard. Father Damien at once paddled out to meet him, intending to take him to land in his own canoe, but the captain blocked that. "'You know that you cannot go ashore,' he told Father Modeste sternly. I have very strict orders to allow no one but the sick to land. But I wish only to visit my confrere. He is not a leper, the priest protested. The rule is that you cannot go, the captain repeated. Father Damien had pulled his frail craft alongside the ship and overheard the conversation. His heart sank. And I am not allowed to come aboard, he asked. No, that too is the rule. I'm sorry. Suddenly an idea struck Damien. Father Modeste, he called, is there anyone aboard who speaks French? No one but me, was the reply. Then I will make my confession from here, announced Damien in a businesslike tone. It may be that no other priest will ever be allowed here, so I wish to make a general confession. Father Modeste leaned over the rail, and Father Damien, kneeling in his canoe, called up his confession. He received absolution and paddled happily back to the leper colony. The effect of the incident on the people aboard the ship was tremendous. The Catholics among them were deeply disturbed, and non-Catholics somewhat bewildered. But all alike were moved and indignant at the occurrence, and it became widely known. Public criticism of the Board of Health grew strong enough to make itself felt. The rule of complete isolation imposed on Father Damien was relaxed sufficiently to enable him to attend to his religious duties. It was now 1875. The first American cardinal, Cardinal McCloskey had made his official visit to Rome. In France there had been violently destructive floods, and in South America Chile had lost seven towns in an earthquake. Egypt had sent a military expedition into Abyssinia, but was defeated. But in Kalawao, the leper colony on Molokai, none of these incidents were known, nor would they have been of interest to the lepers. These were now all housed in decent huts. Father Damien even had a rectory for himself a palatial building measuring about 12 feet by 15 feet. There was, of course, a slight running battle going on constantly between Damien and the government in Honolulu. 
The priest knew what food would help his people and felt that they should have it. He was convinced they needed more clothing and more medication than was available. At intervals, doctors were assigned to the leper colony, but after calling a few times, they invariably resigned. Father Damien was really doctor and nursing staff combined, and he wanted medical supplies. He wanted, too, some musical instruments. Music played an important part in his plans, and his first instruments were made of metal salvaged from oil cans. Although he himself dug decent graves and built coffins, he found it hard to interest the Kanakas in conducting services for the almost daily funerals. So he had decided to organize a burial society. The men of the society would be formed into a band playing, on flutes, guitars, horns, and drums, the solemn music which accompanied the body to its grave. Women members would wear distinguishing sashes, Father Damien then had an even better idea. He would form two societies. The rivalry between them, he felt, would assure attention to his roles for dignity and decorum. He was quite right. There were also in the colony lepers not of his spiritual flock, some of whom had begun by resenting him even while he dressed their sores. Before long, they too came closer, drawn by their love of music. They began attending Sunday Mass, for Father Damien was always insistent on including every beautiful bit of ritual. In consequence, he had many adult baptisms. Next, he began training choirs. They weren't choirs, really, but singing groups, which anyone might join. But here again, he developed a sense of rivalry and of accomplishment, which up to then had been non-existent in Kalawao. Almost every evening, Father Damien would seat himself under the pandanus tree which for so long had been his home. Snuggled close to him always were the children, his dearest parishioners. Around him would be seated the rest of his blind, crippled, maimed flock. Altogether they would sing. Sometimes the hymns would be old, traditional music. Sometimes they would be new tunes, with words made up to fit the people's own situation. Truly a lifting of the mind and heart to God. Father Damien was determined that the pall of gloom, which had so long covered the colony, should be lifted. He was wise enough to make use of games and diversions, and one of his acts was to introduce the sport of horse racing. The Kanakas found, in this, tremendous pleasure and excitement. For the children, who had first place in his heart, he made balls and kites and stilts, and invented numerous games and contests. Then he painted the church. He used the gaudy color scheme, which might have seemed laughable to outsiders, but which, to those who used it, was beautiful. Having accomplished so much, he began months ahead, to plan for the Corpus Christi procession. The women who still had two hands began plating reeds for the making of baskets. Those who were not able to do this work spent extra hours in the flower gardens. Now, at last, the lepers were looking forward with anticipation, instead of backward with sadness. Father Damien prayed thankfully to the loving heart of Christ. His few catechists were busy instructing the children, and some adults, as to the meaning of the great day approaching. It was good, they agreed, that all the children in the procession were to wear decorative rosettes, the women bright sashes, the men their best clothing, clean and fresh. But the day was a holy day, first and foremost, and must be observed as such. The classes listened eagerly to all that was said, and when the great day came, everything went as planned. Shortly after Corpus Christi, there was further excitement. Bishop Magritte, having received permission from a new and more understanding government, was to make a pastoral visit. So again, festive and religious preparations were made, and the people looked forward eagerly to the coming of a revered and beloved guest. On June 8th, every member of the colony who could walk, or who had someone to carry him, was on the rocky shore, as the ship carrying the bishop dropped anchor. With eager, burning eyes, they watched him being rowed ashore, and as he stepped on land and greeted Father Damien, a cheer arose. The band struck up a tune, and with flags and banners fluttering, the lepers formed a line to escort the priest and bishop to the colony. When they reached the priest's tiny house, the music was silent. One of the older men stepped forward, bowed toward the bishop, and began a little speech. We wish to thank you for having allowed Father Damien to come to us, he began. Poor Damien flushed, thoroughly uncomfortable. He overwhelms us with his solicitous care, the man went on. With his own hands he builds our houses. When one of us is ill, he tends us, and gives us tea and sugar and biscuits. To the poor he gives clothes, and he makes no distinction between Catholics and Protestants. To Father Damien's great gratitude, that was the end of the speech. Singing, the Kanakas moved off, 
and Damien and the bishop began an inspection tour of the colony. "'You have accomplished much,' said Bishop Maggot, with satisfaction. "'This water system is fine, and the clean, sturdy houses are not to be mentioned in the same breath as the hovels they replaced.' Father Damien ignored the praise, but used the opportunity to put in a plea. "'Our colony is growing. We could use many more houses if we had materials to build them.' It was so throughout the day. The bishop found a great deal to praise. Each time, Father Damien brushed the kind words aside to point out how much more needed to be done, how many more of his flock could be comforted and encouraged if more money and material were available. The next day, Sunday, a solemn mass was sung. Among the gifts brought by the bishop were red cassocks and white surplices for the altar boys. The congregation was entranced at such splendor. Bishop Magritte, on his side, was unable to hold back his tears as the diseased horse and choir voices sang a Mozart mass. The afternoon was even harder on the bishop's self-control. The chapel was crowded with men, women, and children, all gaily decked with flowers and ribbons. Eager and excited, they knelt, while 135 newly baptized walked or were helped to the altar rail for confirmation. More deeply moved than he had ever been, the bishop held his emotions firmly in check, so as not to delay the solemn proceedings. But often he was obliged to pause, trying to find on the forehead a piece of sound skin which he could mark with the holy oil. Damien and his bishop talked until late into that night. There were so many problems facing the priest, so many tasks which he could see needed doing. The orphans, he said, their case is the worst of all. They are on my mind day and night. What have you been able to do for them? asked the bishop. Very little, Damien answered sadly. A few I have been able to place in homes, but many, both boys and girls, are living almost like animals. They find food and shelter where and when they can. An orphanage, the bishop suggested. If only I could get lumber, I would build one, for the girls at least. You shall have what you need, the bishop assured him. At the end of five days, a boat anchored offshore, ready to take Bishop Magritte back to Honolulu. His visit had brought joy and encouragement to the people, help and consolation to their priest. It was wonderful to know that the bishop's return to his home would mean the shipping of material for the orphanage. Of all his flock, the children were dearest to him. Lumber, nails, some pipes, a few new tools all came on the next ship. With them were packages of clothing for the children, collected by the nuns on the island. If Damien had seemed tireless before, there was now no end to his strength. From before dawn until after dark he labored, and when, at last the girl's hymn was finished, his joy knew no limit. A kind, loving woman, whose husband and children had been left behind in Honolulu, was put in charge of the orphanage. After a struggle, Father Damien succeeded in getting the government to increase the weekly allowance of meat and taro for the children. But since the supply was small and irregular in arriving, he planted a big field of sweet potatoes behind the orphanage to supplement the ration. The question of proper food was constantly on his mind. It flowed from there to his pen, and letters to the Board of Health. He kept demanding medicine as well. At times, as has been said, the Board of Health would appoint a doctor to the island. The man would come on rare visits, flit hastily past the cabins, look into the hospital, and then disappear. Thereupon he would usually resign his charge, unable to tolerate the idea of another trip. Sooner or later, more often later, another man would be appointed. So medical attention was really the problem of Damien. He learned all he could about the art of healing, or at least of easing pain, and even taught himself a little crude surgery. But mainly, he set himself to keep the hospital clean. A few men with less advanced cases of leprosy, men who still had arms and legs, volunteered to help him. Father Damien outlined the procedure they were to follow. But when none of the men was available, the priest himself cleaned the sores, treated the wounds, scrubbed the floors, and went on to his next duties. The one consistent help he ever had on Molokai was the support and approval of Mr. Meyer, the government appointee in charge of the island. Both priest and governor were men of strong character, and they often disagreed, but on minor matters only. In what concerned the best interests of the lepers, they were sincerely and firmly united. The good Father Damien, that was the way in which Mr. Meyer always referred to him. The girls' orphanage was completed. While it was too small to shelter all who needed shelter, it was the beginning. As to the boys, all Father Damien could do for them at present 
was to teach them religion at the school which the government provided. He plunged with full energy into the task of building a boy's home. At about this time, a letter from Father Modeste repeated a warning. Be careful. Do not expose yourself needlessly and fall victim to this fearful disease. In answer, he wrote, as he had written to his own worried mother, I live well. I have my two meals a day at home. For breakfast I have rice, sometimes meat and coffee, with a few biscuits. In the evening I dine on what is left from the morning, with a cup of tea, the water for which I boil over a lamp. He carefully omitted the fact that if, at noon, he was in the home of a leper, he accepted food from the diseased hands, and shared the dishes and utensils used by the sick. He was often glad to get into the open and light his pipe. The smoke helped remove from his nostrils the dreadful stench which always surrounded these unfortunate people. It was the year 1882. The poet Longfellow died, as did the Italian revolutionary leader Garibaldi. Congress passed a bill suspending Chinese immigration for ten years. An attempt was made to assassinate the King of Serbia. British battleships intervened in Egypt to keep the Suez Canal open for world transport. But these matters were unknown to, and would have had no interest for Father Damien. An immediate disaster was threatening him. The carriage he used in driving about the island was falling apart. He had been nine years in the leper colony, and even his powerful body was beginning to feel the strain. His crisp black hair was growing gray at the temples, and his eyes, long ago weakened by overstudy, were tortured by the tropic sun. He desperately needed the carriage to transport the food and clothing and drugs which he carried about on his visits. Perhaps a nail, he suggested hopefully to the man who was helping him try to get the vehicle into shape again. A nail? Many nails would be no help, father. It must go to Honolulu and be fixed properly. To Honolulu? But that would cost a great deal, I'm afraid. You're quite sure that we could not. I'm sure, father. We might get this shaft fixed or cut a new one. But look at that axle. Father Damien looked and sadly nodded agreement. We will send it to Honolulu by the next boat. The carriage went off, and for some days Father Damien tramped or rode horseback, loaded down like a peddler. He wondered hopefully if the Board of Health would underwrite the expense of the repairs. The present board seemed more inclined to cooperate, he felt, although as yet he had not much contact with them. He waited eagerly confident that within the month his carriage would be back ready for use again. But when the ship, which now came regularly to the island, put in the following week, the captain handed Damien a letter. He saw upon it the seal of the Board of Health, and his heart sank. They cannot refuse to fix up my carriage, he said to himself. It is outrageous. I'll write and say. But first I'd better read the letter. He tore the envelope open and read its message, hardly comprehending it. Reverend and dear Father Damien, some days ago you sent here for repairs the carriage which serves you at the leprosorium. It appears to me pretty well used up. Appreciating highly the services you so faithfully render to the unfortunate lepers, the board authorized me to get you a new carriage. I am sending it to you, begging you to accept it with the expression of my affection and my profound esteem. The signature was that of the head of the new board, a man who was to show his regard for Damien time and again. Walter M. Gibson, President of the Board of Health. And there, incredibly, was the carriage being unloaded onto the beach, new and shining, complete in all its parts. That evening there was much to talk about. It had become the custom for the natives to gather at dusk, and squatting in a circle around him as he took his tea in the clearing before his house, to talk and laugh and tell stories. They were always fascinated with his recollections of Trimaloo and the life there. A world of brick houses, a skating of so many things, completely unknown to these people of the South Seas. They talked of the new carriage, and then of the carriages which Father Damien had seen in the Louvain and in Paris. The more accomplished of the group even took their guitars, and strummed a soft accompaniment to songs they made up about the new carriage. Tea was finished, after the usual hilarity over who would share it with Father, because he had only six cups. Then he took out his pipe gave puffs to anyone who asked, and the evening was over. The next day was Sunday, and the carriage was in use early. Father Damien said Mass, distributing hundreds of communions. He then drove to various houses to which he brought prayer leaders, who would conduct services for the really disabled lepers, those unable to travel as far as the church. After this, he went on to the second leper colony, which had been established farther down the island, at Kalapapa. 
The Kanakas loved music, and, before the disease reached their throats, many had had beautiful voices. These singers were now at all in a state of excitement, for the Christmas music was being prepared. Other preparations for the divine child's birthday were being made. On December 22nd, Father Damien spent the afternoon at the hospital hearing the confessions of those too sick to get to church. On the following morning, he brought Holy Communion to them. This was one of his hardest, most delicate tasks. He must do nothing to distract the patient from the awesomeness of the moment. Yet, on his own part, he must take great care that no indignity happened to the host while being received by a person who had no eyes or lips. After leaving the hospital, he said Mass. Then the decorating of the church began. All the young people who were able had been busy for days gathering greens, which had been skillfully woven into long ropes to be festooned about the church. The arches of the altar were outlined in green. Candles, carefully hoarded up for the great day, were placed in the six chandeliers of the church and in the candlesticks. Everything possible was done to prepare the church for the coming of the Christ child. Many of the Kanakas were devoutly making the Stations of the Cross. They understood, no one would be able to understand more fully, the connection between the manger and the cross. Baptisms and confessions filled the afternoon of the 24th. At eleven that evening, Christmas Eve, Father Damien rang the church bell. At the signal, the boys and girls poured out of their houses dressed in their best. They hardly needed the lanterns and torches they carried, for the moonlight seemed almost as bright as day. The young people marched from house to house, waking all who might be asleep, beating drums and calling, Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas! Father Damien looked at them, crippled, maimed, and yet full of the joy of the Savior's birth. Infant of Bethlehem, he prayed, come to them tonight and stay with them as they walk the road to Calvary. By a quarter past midnight, the church was filled. Prayers were begun, and the choir burst into a Christmas hymn. The organist had been a concert pianist in Honolulu. Though the fingers of her left hand were gone, she managed the bass with a stick tied to her forearm and coaxed lovely music from the little harmonium. The altar boys prowled in their red cassocks and white surplices, the newly baptized receiving their first communion at this blessed hour. The congregation, many of whom went to Mass every morning, all felt the awesomeness, the breathless wonder of this midnight Mass. They shared awareness of the amazing miracle of the birth of the child Christ, whose body was being offered in an unbloody sacrifice on the altar. Living with death, they were aware of life. Few people came to the dawn mass, but at ten o'clock, when high mass was sung, the church was again filled well ahead of time. Christ's birthday was being truly honored on Malachi. The hours between high mass and benediction in the late afternoon were filled with feasting and music and laughter. Every household would have liked to have Father Damien as guest, but he had desperately sick to visit and nurse, his dying to prepare. Christ had come to some of his flock. Others were going to meet him. In 1881, Queen Regent Liliuokalani governed the islands while her brother the king was traveling. She decided to go to see Malachi. A flower deck quay had been constructed to ease the landing of the royal party, and 700 of the lepers were near the beach to extend greeting. They were dressed in their finest, which happened to be the uniforms of the burial society, but the queen was unaware of that. Children carrying flower-filled baskets marched ahead of the guests, strewing petals on the path leading to a flower-covered pavilion. Here, Father Damien and Mr. Meyer were waiting to receive the visitors. Lulio Kalani looked eagerly about her. She had heard much of this leper colony and of the priest who had devoted his life to its people. The crowd grouped around her, both repelled and fascinated her. She looked more closely and saw in the crowd a woman she had once known well. She spoke to her friend. The woman eagerly stepped forward, and then fell back. As a leper, she must not approach the queen. Tears came to the eyes of Lilio Kalani. She stood up, and the party made ready to move off, to spend to the best advantage the hour they were to be ashore. The queen wanted to see all of the buildings, all of the gardens, everything that was being done. The hour passed, and another, and the whole day. Uneasy, the captain made ready to move as quickly as possible when the royal party should arrive. Dusk came, and dark soon to be dispelled by a low-hanging moon. Then, almost fainting in pride, came the lepers bearing the royal torches ahead of the queen. The privilege of carrying those lights was ordinarily reserved for members of the court. Lilio Kalani stood on the beach to say goodbye. She held out her hand to Father Damien. 
with a quick, touching gesture of gallantry, he bent and kissed it. "'You are so good,' she said, her voice choked with emotion. "'You, a strong, healthy man, sacrificing your life to these poor lepers.' Father Damien was surprised. "'But these are my parishioners,' he replied simply. "'Your parishioners, my people,' said the queen. She controlled herself until she got aboard the ship, and then gave way to tears. Shortly after her visit, she wrote to Father Damien, paying high and sincere tribute to the work he was doing. In evidence of her appreciation of his labors, she conferred on him the title of Knight Commander of the Royal Order of Kalakaula. With the title went the privilege of enjoying all the rights, perquisites, and privileges which, by law, pertain to this order, and of wearing such insignia as have been established by warrant. Nothing could have interested Damien less than being a knight and wearing a decoration, but he did hope that the privileges would include a response from the Board of Health when he asked for better food and adequate clothing for his lepers. Bishop Magret, old now, and preparing to retire from active duty, went to Malachi for a last visit. The queen entrusted to him the jeweled cross of knighthood for Damien. He was a knight, a crusader, long before the title was officially given him, said the bishop to the priest who accompanied him on the trip. His insigne was, and is, the Sacred Hearts. The visitors landed on Kanaka'ai, the part of Malachi on which Mr. Meyer lived. He was to accompany them to the leprosorium. It is a hard trip, he said, looking doubtfully at the frail old bishop. We will manage, I think, smiled the old man in reply. Father Damien came to meet them, and at dawn the next morning, the party began the difficult crossing of the uncrossable divide. They rode up the steep poly and reached the plateau at the top. Then Mr. Myers sent the horses back, and the men went on foot. The descent was grueling. Often they were obliged to sit and literally inch along, hauling themselves by the heels, using their hands as brakes. Once they skirted a dreadful chasm, into which, not long before, a herd of steers had stumbled to their death. Over the carcasses, vultures still hovered. At last the party reached the bottom. Since there was a reception committee awaiting them, they retired behind some bushes and brushed each other off as best they could. Then, behind a mounted guard, with a band leading the procession, they marched a mile and a half to Kalawao. The settlement was lavishly decorated, the lepers dressed in festal clothing. The women's white dresses were made from old curtains someone had sent from the chapel. The air was charged with excitement. The bishop spoke at length on the honor being paid Father Damien, and then read aloud the queen's letter of praise. The crowd laughed and sobbed and cheered. The bishop pinned the gem-encrusted cross, symbol of his knighthood, on Father Damien's habit. A day of celebration began, but later on the bishop suddenly asked, Where is your decoration, Father? In my pocket, grinned Damien. It shames my patched cassock. Come, come, Father, said the bishop reprovingly. The people are proud of it and like to see it. Put it on. If it makes my children happy, Father Damien reached in his pocket, took out the decoration, and pinned it on again. Except for the happiness of seeing his bishop, the day meant very little to Father Damien, and his hope that his request for help would be given more prompt attention was soon dashed. Added to lack of interest in Malachi's problems, there was now actual antagonism in many quarters in Honolulu. Indignation that this annoying priest should have been given a coveted decoration by the queen. "'Can you not send milk?' Father Damien wrote. "'The lepers, at least the children, should have it every day.' But no milk came. "'Diet is very important in this disease,' he protested in another letter. "'And we need more good food and more variety. We need hospital supplies.' All too often the requests were unheeded. All too often Father Damien was without medicine or solve to ease the pain of his sick flock, without bandages to cover their sores. The Board of Health tells me that funds are low, Father Damien groaned, that they cannot send money or supplies just now. In their comfortable office, well clothed and well fed, it is probably very easy to be stern about sufferings they do not even see. End of Chapter 9 Recording by Maria Therese